Jim Holland, and I'm, uh, I'm your host for this quarter for Design at Large. Uh, and Design at Large is a special, uh, very special series of speakers. And, and it's always, I don't know, I always get nervous when I'm introducing a friend. Uh, and, uh, and Jeff is surely that. Uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to introduce Jeff. I was, we were talking beforehand, and I was thinking back to when I first met Jeff. Uh, he was at UCSD even before me. Uh, he came to UCSD in 1977, uh, I think. And I think I first met Jeff uh, when I went up to his lab. I'm just coming back from a board meeting. And a board meeting in those days was uh, Mark Wall and our system program and I going surfing at last. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked about a lot of stuff there, and a lot of system stuff. And we had this Unix issue. And he said, we should ask Jeff about this. And I didn't know who this Jeff was. Uh, so we went up to Jeff's lab, and there Jeff was hacking the, ter the kernel of Berkeley Unix. And uh, we asked his question, and, and I'm sure he gave us uh, an answer. So that's my sort of <laughs> not necessarily a good one, but yeah. yeah it's uh, my earliest remember memory of, of Jeff, and um, and the you know I remember thinking like who is this guy who can hack the kernel of you know Berkeley Unix and also is a linguist and and uh, and things and you know how could you possibly do both? Uh, kinds of things, and not only does he do both, both, but he does much more. I think UC San Diego and and actually the whole worldwide cognitive science community uh, have benefited enormously from his research and leadership now for over 40 years. Uh, his honors are too numerous to it to list, but the one that is I think most special to me, and I think maybe to Jeff, is the Rumelhart Prize, uh, and. Dave was one of my mentors and, and a dear, dear friend. Uh, and Jeff, like Dave, thinks really deeply about fundamental issues in language and cognition. And, and I think more than almost anyone else, he exemplifies the model I have of Dave, or DER, as he was known <laughs> in, in those days. Uh, and he's. Uh, it's really built bridges to sort of all the domains that, uh, that cognitive science draws on. Uh, and he just does it all. Uh, he's perhaps best known for computational modeling. Uh, many of you have heard about recurrent neural networks uh, designed to recognize patterns and sequences of data and the role they play in many deep learning applications today. In tribute to Jeff, these are known as Elman nets. Uh, he's also contributed really field-changing theoretical work. You know, just one example is his uh, rethinking innate in his book with a number of colleagues. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, there is a continuing stream of thoughtful empirical studies uh, in his work. And I could go on and on uh, with that. But I wanted to mention maybe some things that people don't know about Jeff. Uh, and uh, one of the things I was surprised about was after he got an undergraduate degree at Harvard, he was a high school teacher uh, in an immigrant community in Boston, uh, teaching history, French, and social studies, uh, and as I understand it, often teaching in Spanish uh, to that group. Uh, you know, periodically I invite folks into our lab to, uh, to talk about the process of writing. Uh, and uh, Jeff was one of those who recently came and talked to us about that. Uh, and Jeff writes better and faster than anyone I know. You know, you send an email to Jeff about some topic, and it's like he has it on a key. <laughs> Coming back is this long, carefully worded, historically <laughs> nuanced <laughs> treatise in perfect English. You know, you know, uh, and Don, you always get like quick response, interesting stuff, 
but with misspellings and all kinds of things. <laughs> uh, you know, and Jeff is just like he go directly to publication. Um, so when he came to talk to us about the writing process, I, I, you know, I wasn't at all surprised that his father was a writer. Uh, and he grew up in a household uh, where there was a lot of writing going on. But suddenly I found out his father was Irvin Elman, and whose writing really spans the whole dramatic arts, uh, you know, including Broadway plays, major studio movies, television, did over 2,000 teleplays for Hallmark Hall of Fame, Studio One, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and others. And he, along with his wife, were the head writers of daytime television series like uh, For Search for Tomorrow and General <laughs> Hospital. Uh, he wrote and produced television series like Ben Casey, which some of us remember, <laughs> The Rifleman. Uh, and uh, he published five books. Uh, he, he died when he was 96 back in 2011. Uh, so here at UCSD, Jeff has been chair of cognitive science, he's been dean of the social sciences, he's the founding director of the Center for Research on Language, founding co-director for the Calvi Institute for Brain and Mind, currently he's the founding co-director of the New Data Sciences Institute. Uh, he's been you know, tremendously influential and you know, in helping us start the design lab. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, given all of this experience, I think we're just extremely fortunate today to have him share his thoughts about designing for change. So, Jeff. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I'm afraid to say anything. <laughs> You'll discover the truth. Uh, when, when, Jim, when you started to say the things that people don't know about me, I'm reminded, I gave a talk at Carnegie Mellon a number of years ago, Jay McClellan was my host, and Jay began by saying, well, some of you may know a lot of things about Jeff, but there's things you don't know. For example, you don't know why he spent five days in jail, and then why he went back to jail, and then the FBI, right? and during the whole talk, I could watch people sitting on their seats waiting for it to end, and predictably the first question was, why were you in jail? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you now. Uh, Jim asked me to talk about the New Data Science Institute, and um, I will do that. Uh, but although it's, you know, maybe interesting in its own right, for me it represents a, a pilot experiment uh, to address a problem I've been thinking about for uh, a number of years. I'm pretty sure it's a problem that many of you have thought about uh, and are aware of. In fact, it's a problem that really confronts virtually all institutions and organizations. Um, aging. It's especially problematic when aging is accompanied by growth, and it's even worse when aging is accompanied by success. Sounds odd, but I think that's the reality. So this is really what I want to talk about, and it's the proper context for anything I'll say later. I will talk about the new Halichiolo Data Science Institute, but I want you to understand what, for me, what that, that is, and I think for the campus, what it might represent. I need to begin with a disclaimer. This is not my area of research. In fact, I'm a little bit uncomfortable uh, because this is largely a subjective account. Um, I will draw on some research, but it's not going to be my usual experience of presenting data, whether it's empirical or computational. Um, and, and so uh, it, to me, it feels awkward. But um, as, as Jim said, I've, I have been at UCSD for over 40 years. Um, there, are, there are those who predate me. Don was one of the founders of this campus, came in the, the mid-60s. Uh, but there are, are not that many who have been here continuously for that period of time. Um, and that, that period of time uh, is roughly 80% of the lifetime of the institution. So it has given me a very interesting perspective of what things were like at the beginning. Uh, when I got here, People like Don, the founders were here, the initial chancellors. We've had eight chancellors. I knew them all on a first name basis. And I've seen what ha what's happened over the intervening um, half, half century. During that time, there's been a lot, a lot of change. Uh, there's been a, about a trebling of the size of the student body and the faculty. Uh, when I got here, there were two colleges, uh, Ravel and Muir, 
The third college had just been established. That's what it was called, third college. We now know it as Warren. When I was in high school, I came down to visit. The campus was being built, and it was a pile of dirt. And when I got here, there was still a lot of dirt around. Um, today, it figures prominently among the top ranks of universities internationally by lots of metrics. Federal funding, we, I think, rank number five in terms of federal contracts and grants. Uh, Nobel Prizes, all the kind of traditional metrics of success. UCSD's had a phenomenal run in the half century. Uh, it's been an interesting history. Um, in fact, the campus was singled out recently as, as being the top university in the golden era of universities that were founded, the large number of universities that were founded in this country after World War II. But there have been other changes as well. And, and these are the things that I think are, are, are troubling and worrisome. Um, the feeling of uh, being increasingly subject to bureaucracy and procedures and red tape, compliance, fear of taking risks. We've been successful, do we want to lose it? The feeling of being siloed, isolated from one another. Um, these are things that, in fact, uh, during the, there was a strategic planning process I'll talk about in a bit, a couple of years ago. It was, it was a real wake up to discover that uh, I wasn't the only one who had the, these sorts of uh, anxieties and concerns that virtually all my colleagues uh, were aware of this and, and lamented it. So this, this got me started thinking about why. This was also a time when, as you mentioned, I, had, I was dean. I was dean for eight years and very enmeshed in the bureaucracy and the institutional functioning. And so, although not a research project formally, I started reading about institutional change, organization, institutional health, innovation, and reflecting on these experiences. So, so the then, the beginnings, just a recap, because I think it's going to be relevant uh, when we turn to later some of the some of the, the research that's been done. This campus started initially as a graduate institution. It was only supposed to be for graduate students during the first year or two, modeled after Scripps. Uh, it was actually then called University of California, La Jolla. Uh, had it changed by the time you got here to yeah, sure. San, San Diego? So it was University of California, La Jolla. It was only going to be for PhD students and maybe a few master's students. That dictated a strategy of hiring an initial cohort of faculty who were senior, because they had to be senior in order to direct PhD dissertations. So the cadre, the, the normal balance of faculty in terms of senior and junior was tilted much more toward the senior end. So if you think about the kind of people who came here, they were clearly accomplished, very often at the top of their game. And then you have to ask what, and, and we often attribute our success to good genes. We had brilliant founding faculty. We had Don Norman, George Mandler. We had you know, all these, all these wonderful, Harold Urey. But, but there was more than just the fact that they were senior. Think about the kind of person who will give up a position at Chicago or Stanford or Penn or Harvard at the top of their game to come to a pile of dirt. Those are going to be, pardon? And surf, and surf, and good weather. Yes, that I'm sure figured prominently. But it's a big risk. So the people who were attracted were people who were willing to take risks. They had a lot of confidence. Some of them, you would say, were even arrogant. They certainly had they certainly had chutzpah, and they were willing to take risks. That was one strong hallmark that really impressed itself on the culture of the campus initially. They were ambitious. It was a small campus. People knew each other. And some of that interaction arose from the very strong tradition in the University of California faculty governance. At the time, we have an academic senate. At the time, it was direct votes. It's now a, there's a representative assembly. But at the time, all the faculty went to the, the, the meetings of the academic senate. And I remember going as an assistant professor and being really impressed with, with these senior people who went and they spouted off and, and ha had opinions and stuff. Uh, but they also got to know each other. So there were committees set up to cite the, uh, what's the central library, what was in, what's now called Geisel. Where's it going to be? Parking lots. Uh, you know, so all sorts of decisions about running the campus involved bringing faculty together from different disciplines. Academic reviews were done at the time by ad hoc committees where there were members from different departments who came together to look at an academic file, decide tenure or not. So there were lots of, of mechanisms that were in play that, that, that 
caused um, interaction between people from different, different disciplines. And, and I think a fourth and, and final consideration was that we had no history. We had nothing to live up to. You can only go up. You can only do better. I mean, you can, you can fail, but failure was just where we started, essentially. So, so there was no um, sense of rankings or history or tradition or the past. And this definitely makes it a whole lot easier to take risks because you got nothing to lose. You, you put all that together and I think you have a stew that really encourages taking chances, doing things that are new. And if you look at the departments we have now, and especially in the early, early days, there was, there was a feeling, I think, that you know, there was no sense, the economics department, no sense in competing with Princeton or MIT and doing what they did, or Chicago, which was the number one. Uh, they did what they did very well. So the economics department here started uh, a focus on what uh, was, was then a very boutique approach, econometrics. And it became part of the mainstream. And it got them two Nobel Prizes in the process. You look at anthropology. You look at psychology. You look at computer science. You look at biology. You look at all of these fields. Because the mainstream was already occupied, it really encouraged exploring new areas. So there's a lot of innovation. Uh, much less fear of, of failure than we, we, we have now. So um, it also sowed the ground for um, not only doing disciplines in new ways, but creating new disciplines. So certainly cognitive science is a wonderful example of something that flourishes from that. Communications, uh, more recently uh, nanoengineering, um, biochemistry, which was new at the time. What's interesting, and I don't understand why, is that the number of departments, this did not lead to an explosion of departments, uh, we now have 25 departments. And we have 29 un interdisciplinary programs. It's a very small number actually compared to other departments. I did a count at Berkeley, went on their web website, I went through the alphabetic list of departments and I stopped at H when I got to 108 departments. It's an extraordinary number very highly differentiated uh, structure uh, com compared to us. So it paid off, it paid off in lots of ways. And I think this campus is a very rich, exciting place. It has been what's kept me here for 41 years. I look elsewhere, I find wonderful work, wonderful people, and I come back here and I say, that my opportunities for learning new things, working with wonderful students, the constraints on, on scholarship and teaching are, are still pretty minimal compared to many other places, but there are, there are issues and, and problems and frustration. So I've, I've mentioned some of them. Uh, bureaucracy, compliance, um, conservatism, a tendency to say, we know what excellence is, it looks like us. And of course that plays out in discouraging diversity of all kinds, people, ideas. Um, it's, as we've grown, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about Roger Hollingsworth's work, um, we, have, we have become differentiated. It is internally, we now have divisions in schools. When I got here, there were no divisions in schools. It was a relatively flat hierarchy. There was the chancellor and there was everybody else. And the faculty talked to the chancellor directly. Um, there are now multiple multiple levels. And, and so we have become what many people call siloed. And it's in stark contrast to the initial environment and culture where there was very rich interaction and freedom of communication and, and um, the, the barriers were, were there, but much lower than in other places. Several years ago, I guess it's been five years ago, we got a new chancellor, Pradeep Kosla. Some of you may know him. Um, and one of the things he said was, you know, the campus is now 50 years old. We should have a strategic plan. I was dean at the time, and my hand was, I think, the first to go up to say, that sounds, with due respect to anybody in this audience who comes from the corporate world, but my objection was, that sounds awfully corporate. What I really meant was that sounds awfully formulaic and mechanical and pro forma. You know, I've seen a lot of strategic plans. They're really nice volumes with nice words, nice photos, and then they get shelved someplace. 
and they don't really impact things. And so I said, I just am dubious about this. And, and the chancellor's response was an interesting one. He says, you know, I really don't care about the product. What I care about is the process. We've been running an automatic for a very long time. We were really lucky at the outset, very lucky to have the right ingredients to allow us to do what we've done. We're now at the point where there are some challenges and we need to start talking to ourselves. And so for two years, there was a strategic planning process. It was the first time I had actually seen substantive conversations between people from the School of Medicine and Scripps and different departments in the, in the general campus. It was, it was very exhilarating. And the first, the, the initially embarrassing discussion we had to have about our values and our mission, I mean, I cringe when, when I'm asked that question. What's your mission? Uh, it actually ended up uh, forcing people to expose themselves in the sense of revealing what their concerns were. I remember sitting next to the chair, the former chair of the Department of, of Economics, Valerie Ramey. She's a wonderful person, um, accomplished economist who travels in rarefied circles. And uh, at some point we had a breakout session and we had to exchange cards saying what for you is the main value of education and Valerie had written, she was my partner, she had written social mobility. I it was not exactly what I expected and I said what do you mean and she said well I came from a first generation college, um, college attendee, college graduate, came from a working class family. Um, for me this transformed my life and I care deeply about access diversity and broadening the pool of people who can come and benefit from higher education. I was very surprised. Um, at another meeting I remember sitting next to, this was early on, sitting next to Mike Norman. Mike is the director of the Supercomputer Center. Um, and it was early on and, and uh, I think there were a dozen of us in the room with the Chancellor. And it was, you know, this was the point where I was still dubious and I didn't really want to be there. And Mike raised his hand and said, I have a question. What are we doing here? And I kind of said, Mike, you know, you can't, that's not polite. But what he meant was not, why the hell am I stuck in this room with 11 other people? What he meant was, why are we here as a university? What is our purpose? What is our goal? Why and how do we justify the enormous resources that are invested in us? What are we doing to make the world a better place? Now, most of us don't readily talk about those kinds of things, making the world a better place improving the lot of humanity, eradicating injustice, right? All these things. This was a wonderful opportunity where these kinds of things got, got discussed openly. And it revealed both the frustrations and the aspirations. And it turns out that everybody lamented our conservatism, our risk aversion. Everybody lamented the endless layers of bureaucracy you have to go. I just had to go through f five levels of, camp levels of campus bureaucracy and then two at the office of the president to get approval to, ha to, to ha have trip cancellation insurance on an expensive trip. I mean, not a big deal, but it was, uh, took up a lot of people's time, including my own. So everybody, everybody um, was, was, was unhappy about this. At some point, I think we also re <laughs> realized, hey, we need to look in the mirror. The people who were involved in this were the campus leadership, top campus leaders, about 60 people over this prolonged discussion. And I, I remember saying, you know, folks, who's to blame? <laughs> None of us are happy with these things that we're doing, and yet we're the folks that are running the show, presumably. So if change is going to happen, it has to happen here. Now, the, the failure, the limitation of that process was for those two years, those 60 people got a lot out of it. It was, it was a very dramatic experience. But because we're a large organization, continuing that discussion at all levels didn't really happen. And it was one of the frustrations and one of the lessons I learned from these kind of processing processes that when they start at the top, which they often have to, the impact is going to be attenuated the further you go. And we'll return to this issue um, in, in just a bit. So these are things that have been taught, you know, I've been thinking about quite a bit. What are the conditions that, wh why, why were we so successful early on? What's happened to us since? And then realizing that, A, we're not that bad. There's a lot of, of good stuff that happens here. I'd rather be here than, than other places I can think of. But these are problems that afflict virtually all large organizations, whether they're academic or, or NGOs or and, and public or, or, or private. 
They're just things that happen. And, and you know, this is probably one way we should understand things like Belcor, Bell Labs, or Xerox PARC, or Google Labs, attempts to, to deal with these sorts of, of issues. But so far, I've just talked about anecdote. And in the course of trying to learn more about it, you know, I first turned to, there's a field of psychology called organization and industrial psychology. It's not that productive. It's not that, not that commonly found at most uh, psychology departments around the, the country. And they deal with things like quality of life and human resources and hiring practices and, uh, you know, conflict resolution and stuff. They don't really deal with these big issues of how do you get institutions at a size to function in a good way, where, where good means productively, innovatively, and do important things. Um, so, so then I discovered Rogers Hollingsworth. Rogers is a historian and sociologist who is at University of Wisconsin. And he's been very fixated on this issue. Um, he, he's written extensively. This is a very nice summary of some work he's done. Uh, Major Discoveries in Biomedical Research Organizations, Perspectives on Interdisciplinarity, Nurturing Leadership, and Integrated Structure and, and Culture. Uh, Rogers actually um, has some, uh, is retired and spends quite a bit of time um, in La Jolla. So uh, he might be an interesting person to, to, to hear. And the problem, as he put it, is, reading from his text, because most research organizations experience considerable inertia and change rather slowly, they have considerable difficulty in adapting to the fast pace of scientific and technological change. Too often a research, or research organization has been a world-class leader in an area of science, but because of organizational inertia and failure to adapt to new trends, it has lost its leading edge. And his hypothesis was that, um, sort of the conjecture was, uh, vaguely, that organizations require distinctive structural and cultural characteristics if their scientists are to continue to make important, innovative, and impactful discoveries. So then the question is, well, what are those characteristics? And his approach was to narrow the scope of inquiry down to a particular area of biomedical, the biomedical field, and to operationalize, come up with some, you know, metrics, proxies for innovation and sustained record of accomplishment. And so, um, and, and those ended up being things like Nobel Prizes, publications, citations, uh, recognized, some of it was subjective, asking people what are the, what are the places that have made really important discoveries and been, have been, been innovative. And um, what he then did was, having identified two places that seemed to be particularly um, score high in, in, along those metrics, those were Caltech, and the Rockefeller University, which he argued for over 100 years, have really a sustained record of this kind of innovation and, and, um, and success, was then to sort of reverse engineer and say, OK, so what do they have in common? What's peculiar about them? And they turn out to be, though the, the difference is they're very similar along a lot of dimensions. I'll warn you, the lesson he's going to come to is one that is Mm, probably not easily generalizable. So there's some insights, but we're going to see we're not you know, we, we, we're not going to be Caltech or Rockefeller in Im important ways. So his his findings briefly. There's a lot, but I, I'll just summarize the major things that that he he found was that the central finding in both of these cases is that uh, major discoveries occurred repeatedly. I'm quoting him now because there was a high degree of interdisciplinarity and integrated activity across diverse fields of science. Scientists with diverse perspectives interacted with intensity and frequency. So then you go back one step and you say, well, how and why did that happen? And there are um, three characteristics that he identifies. One is they're small. By itself, this can and will encourage interaction. They also had mechanisms explicitly to facilitate interaction. Both of them happen to use uh, one mechanism, the same mechanism, have a, uh, a dining room, restaurant, which is really good. Uh, we see this actually, if you've ever been up to Google or Twitter or some of these places, lots of nice food. And so both Rockefeller and, um, and Caltech have, have, have dining areas that are, um, 
they're like world class in terms of food and people like to go there and they do go there and it's small enough that you end up sitting at the tables of eight for eight people those are the only size tables so you can't sit by yourself you end up sitting with people who you may not know initially and so it promotes a lot of a lot of discussion number two is there is minimal internal differentiation neither Caltech nor Rockefeller have traditional departments Caltech has programs Rockefeller doesn't even have that Caltech you can get a PhD in political science it is supervised that program is supervised by a bunch of faculty in a different areas but there's not a department the same is true at Rockefeller what that means is that there is a lot of flexibility and agility in adapting to change so for example in molecular biology came started to, to be, be, become visible as a, as a new approach to biology uh, in the early part of the last century uh, Rockefeller was able to hire these strange people called molecular biologists because they didn't have a department of botany or biology they didn't have a biology program that required that there be a botanist and a zoologist and an X and a Y and a Z so that when professor you know whoever famous world famous professor of botany retired or died you don't have to replace them in kind to keep the program going so there was a lot of freedom a lot of degrees of freedom in order to experiment and and it promoted a high degree of agility as well as scholarly interaction and the third characteristic was this this sort of funny combination of visionary leadership and a very flat hierarchy so in both cases he talks about a succession of the university presidents that really did have a vision and they were strong leaders but they were strong leaders in a in a, in a context where there was a very direct access and interaction between them and the faculty which meant that they they talked to and heard and it also meant that their vision so so when I applied for, for the, the, the Dean job I was asked predictably what's your vision for social sciences and and I had anticipated that and I realized you know usually what's meant by that or the answer that's given is what's your agenda and I realized that you know being visionary often means more literally the ability to see it means a combination of being able to see the potential it also means having values and having judgment about what's feasible and so these were all leaders who saw potential were able to bring people together because it was a flat hierarchy because it was small they used powers of persuasion and when that didn't work they made decisions but there was a high degree of understanding and and trust because of this very close relationship between the leadership and and the the, the faculty it was particularly important um, in hiring so so the hiring that was done often did reflect the leadership the president's view about new directions and uh, was not simply something that was run on on automatic so these were these were three of the characteristics that um, that Hollingsworth identifies as really critical and in contrast we have most large organizations I won't single us out as being particularly egregious this is true um, for all of them I think so um, one of the problems is that even if you start off small as we did you grow now this may not be by choice we have grow we've been mandated to grow we're a state institution we are expected to accommodate in education more and more students and this is our mission and we want to do that uh, and so there is growth a natural tendency when there's growth to manage it is to modularize divide and conquer bureaucratize split into departments split into divisions it's very hard to have an effective organization uh, of a thousand faculty and 30,000 students who you know all just talk to each other it's not going to happen so that's a real problem how do you accommodate growth uh, and yet deal with the strong pressures uh, to differentiate internally so we now have 
five academic divisions, we have two professional schools, we have a whole, well, we got a lot of stuff. The deci it affects decision making in interesting ways. So e you either have two approaches. You have a very strong leader in this context who, who makes top-down decisions. But because of the multiple layers between them and the, the troops, the people who are actually doing the work, um, those decisions are often ill-informed or uninformed. They reflect blue sky you know, uh, imaginings of the leader about what should happen and what might happen. So the vision is actually uh, blind. People are blinded because they actually are not in a position to see the potential. There's poor communication. It's very difficult. We have a chancellor who's very gregarious and he talks to everybody he can. Does he talk to everybody? Literally, no, he can't. Not his fault, he tries. But, but there are really limits on, on communication. And, and they, there are limits on implementation. So you may have a strong leader who has a wonderful idea and says, you know, uh, do it. Um, well, that gets implemented at the next level and the next and the next and, the, and it tends frequently not to happen. Right? And, and uh, woe betide the chancellor who tries to enforce every decision at all 20 levels between the chancellor and where it needs to be executed. Um, so, so that's a real, a real challenge to that model of dealing with size is to have strong leadership. The other is to have decentralization. Let every unit do its own thing. Uh, Harvard does this, they have this, this phrase, every tub on its own bottom. It's the way the budget is done, they're all responsible for themselves, it's, it's decentralized in a lot of ways. But the problem there is, um, there is no broad vision. It's just the decisions are limited to whatever unit is making the decisions. And the ability of one group to understand a bigger picture is fairly limited through no fault of their own. This is what will result in silos. And uh, it will result in specialization and balkanization. Now specialization, I don't want to say that you don't need to have specialized knowledge, but you need people who can share that specialized knowledge and structures that encourages and allows them to, to do it. Um, I said one of the, one of the concerns uh, of aging is aging and success. And, and you, you know, as I've, I've hinted, the problem here is that success the ingredients for the prior success easily become the recipe for the future. You do what you did before. It worked the first time. Let's have a sequel. And then there's version three and four and so on. And at some point it just becomes a tired and sterile rehash of the past. There is secondly a tendency to focus on proxies of success, rankings. Uh, number of alumni who contribute, prizes, publications, as opposed to focusing on, so the reason why the economics department got their two Nobel Prizes was not in order to get a Nobel Prize, it was to do something impactful and original and interesting. And so the goal should be contributions, which if you have confidence and faith and you're successful, will result in all of these metrics of success floating to the top. But it's very easy to focus on the, 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 the metrics and just game the system, or try to game the system in that way. And then finally, um, we, we end up with a tremendous fear of failing. Um, uh, and, and that leads to risk aversion. So these are, as I said, problems that I think afflict everybody. And the question is, we cannot not grow. We can't be a Caltech or a Rockefeller. We've already grown, and, and we probably need to. And that's going to be true for many organizations, so what do you do? This is the context in which, when the chancellor asked me if I would work with Rajesh Gupta to start this institute, I had known that this was going to happen for about a year. I knew there was going to be a major gift. And, um, you know, I, I hectored the chancellor by saying, Look, don't blow this one. There was a $75 million gift at stake, and the campus was going to match it with, with a, a large investment. Don't blow this one. Don't just create another in data Science Institute, the way everybody and their sister-in-law is doing. Uh, this has got to be unique and special. And uh, that was the point where he said, okay, loud mouth. <laughs> uh, if there's failure, it'll be your fault. <laughs> 
But what he said was, you know, we've talked during the strategic plan about our current structures not working well in many ways. And he and I had talked about, uh, you know, other, other options and models and stuff. And he said, so view this as an experiment, as a pilot, that will break the mold in lots of ways. Now, as conservative as campuses tend to be, when you call something a pilot, you can often get away with murder. Because people are, you know, people are afraid of, well, that will set a precedent for doing something else. And then, you know, you do this, and then everybody will also have to do the same thing. And so this was, was a strategy of saying, it's an experiment. It's a well-calculated, thought-out experiment. If it succeeds, that's great. But you want to co continually being, you know, assessing what it does and then do a, what academics call revise and resubmit. <laughs> the design cycle, I guess you could, could call it. So, so that was really what got me interested. Um, it connects with my own research and own interests. It connects with a lot of concerns I have. Um, so to, to talk about this institute, it will be announced formally in, in two weeks. You know, and it's based on the observation, and this was also what got me interested. The data are really important, and they're also, we, we have entered an era where the, the kind of data that we can, we can collect data at a scale and a scope that almost defies imagination over every aspect of activity that occurs on the face of this planet and potentially in the cosmos. From the, you know, the, the nano, the angstrom level to the, I was going to say the peta level, but then I discovered there's exos and zetas and yatos. I mean, we can't keep up with the, the scales. Huge amount of data about really important stuff. We're also looking at the potential to use data that are aggregated from multiple so sources to solve serious problems. So climate change really involves understanding not just the chemistry, uh, but the social organizations that are feeding into this and trying to make changes involves lots of data from diff very different domains that have never talked to each other. So that's very, that's very attractive, and, 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 and the potential then is for, for these data to be able to allow us to address problems and understand problems that um, we, we might not otherwise. But they're really serious cha challenges, and, and these are the challenges that the Institute is particularly attentive to. Um, some of them are technological. Those are not, that is, you know, the storage of these data, the high-speed, high-performance computing, shuffling them around. Yeah, those are, those are challenges. Um, also, somewhat obvious are the sort of methodological algorithmic challenges. We don't have tools that are really available to deal with the complexity of data that, 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 that is available. But there are other, other, other challenges as well. So if you are a data scientist who is bringing together a data from oceanographers, genetics, political science I actually know a problem in a group that's doing this. Very unlikely sources of data. They're trying to aggregate this to deal with a problem because they feel that all these data are relevant. Well, the reality is those data were collected typically for other purposes. Data are not pristine, pure, and just, you know, wonderful. They're collected for purposes, which means they've been filtered with some goal in mind. And there are gaps and limitations. But the data scientists who I know are working on this stuff, they don't know about where those data, the origins, the provenance, the quality of those data, the relevance of those data. And this is increasingly becoming an issue as people are collecting data together and, uh, you know, and then just crunching, crunching whatever comes out and coming to some conclusion. So, so um, big data are very often bad data. And, um, and so that's sort of a less obvious challenge that, that we're quite concerned about. We're also... Um, concerned about um, the use of data. Some of you may have heard of Cambridge Analytica. If you haven't, Google them. How many people know about Cambridge Analytica? You know what they are? Right. So Robert Mercer, very brilliant guy, started this thing. And there is reasonable evidence to believe that a lot of data from Facebook was harvested, including data from a social psychologist who invented a game and app that will tell you what your personality traits are, the big five. Are you gregarious? Are you, you know, all of this stuff. And it was aggregated and correlated with a lot of publicly available data, uh, voting record, uh, job history, criminal history, all kinds of stuff. And it led to creating videos that were targeted at Facebook um, users. And the videos would take the form of um, an African-American woman who said, 
My family's been involved with the civil rights movement for years. I've voted, you know, I'm a Democrat. I've voted for years and years and years, but I'm just disillusioned. I'm going to sit this one out. And then there was the white male by accent, clearly from Appalachia or West Virginia, who said, I've never voted in my life. My family's never, I don't even know if my grandpappy was a Democrat or Republican. I haven't cared. But boy, am I excited. I'm going to vote. You can imagine sort of what the consequence was, right? It was what Richard, <laughs> Richard Taylor is called the nudge <laughs> on steroids. So the ability to manipulate behavior in non-obvious ways is becoming a significant consequence of access to these kinds of rich data sets. So the use, and there's lots of different examples of unintended consequences to ranking schools, on the real estate market, all kinds of stuff. So we need to think about the use of data. It's, it's people talk about data ethics. It's not just privacy and ownership. The tip of the iceberg. <coughs> The, the consequences are far, far, far greater. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that we need to worry about. Um, the data can be important and for good, but can be dangerous. So the strategy that, that we've taken, and, and, and we, we will be announced in two weeks since March, Rajesh Gupta, my co-director, and I have, have tried to work out a strategy to lay the foundation. So we've had the good fortune to be in this long, extended quiet phase where we're just planning. So it's been to explore, whatever that means. Uh, explore what's possible, define what we want to do, and then, and then launch. And um, there, there are a couple of things that I guess I want to say um, about this exploring, <laughs> should be exploring process. Um, we, we did an inventory. Since March, we've, we've talked to over 400 faculty. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the largest survey that's been done face-to-face -face ever on this campus by anyone for any purpose. It's not a strategy that scales well, and there are always the people who haven't been talked to who wonder, and with some anxiety and anger, why haven't you come to see me? And we'll have to explain, well, there's just two of us, <laughs> and, and we're doing it one person at a time. But what that has, has, what that has revealed is an enormous enthusiasm, and the fact that data permeates virtually every aspect of scholarship, including philosophy, visual arts, music areas you might not have thought um, would, would be very rich fields for this. So there's been a real um, enthusiasm. We're initially greeted with people who say, well, I thought I did data science. You're going to do it now? So Berkeley's strategy has been to create a division of data science and predictably engineering and uh, you know, other fields are saying, well, information science saying, well, we thought we did data science. So we have been over backwards to say our goal is not to take turf or define turf or to own turf. Our goal is to help uh, build turf for everybody and to really enforce the notion that we want to work with you and help you and build what you're doing, but to connect you. And, and so it's been a very laborious, arduous process, but it is it seems to be the right way to go in terms of trying to um, build trust and, and credibility. The definition I want to talk about, which is the other thing that we've, we've, so this is sort of trying to compensate for the hierarchical. The, rather than have the chancellor come out and say, we're going to do X and you know, I hope you all fall in line, our goal has been to try to get to the, the level of the people who are actually concerned with and if there's going to be any action, going to be doing it. So, I'm not sure how, how replicable that model is. It's, as I say, we've had the luxury of working for nine months to do it, but I, we think it's the right thing to do. You just got to take the time to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. The second is to be guided by, uh, this, is, this is the vision part. We see opportunities, some of which are already seen and known to the players. So we go to the Global Policy Studies uh, School, and we meet with Gordon Hansen, who says, we have this big pixel initiative. We're using satellite data um, about nightlight activity um, to make inferences about economic development, about all infrastructure, about all kinds of stuff. They've partnered with the World Bank and with Google Earth on this project. They view themselves as a research cluster. And it's highly, highly multidisciplinary with people from all kinds of fields, including uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, uh, Cal IT2, many different departments. 
And so that's wonderful. That's a ready-made group or project, or we've been calling them clusters. There are lots of other clusters that we have seen as we talk to people. Oh, do you know, you know, talk to um, people who are interested in pharmacogenomics about prediction for drug discovery and dosage and stuff. Do you know about Granger causality? Do you know about, Granger was one of the people in the economics department who got this Nobel. Do you know about George Sugihara down at Scripps, physicist, about his work using cross-convergent mapping to make predictions about complex time series and things. No, never heard about these things, right? So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in ter terms of bringing people together to share tools and, and guidance, and people are very excited about that. And in other cases, it's just, we're saying, well, you 10 people seem to be working in the same area. Let's have a meeting, and we put people in a box, and we shake the box. And sometimes they just walk out kind of dazed and, you know, <laughs> asking Mike Norman's question, why, why we were here. Um, and that's okay, right? Not everything is going to work. Uh, some of it has resulted in follow-ups between subgroups and stuff. So here the strategy is the institute will be driven by these kind of faculty initiated clusters. No fixed number of them, not for us to decide. People come to us and say, we want to do this. Can we work with you? What the thing that we've insisted on is we're not a funding agency. We're not putting out RF requests for proposals. We're not trying to dangle carrots, but we are saying we do have resources. But really what we need to know from you, what are your aspirations? What do you want to do that you can't do currently? What would you need to make that happen? We can certainly lobby the chancellor to say, this group needs these resources. We may have resources ourselves that we can advocate. So, so this is a very strong bottom-up strategy, but with hopefully the leadership from, from us and a faculty council that will be created um, to, to use some judgment. We are all campus. We're, we used to say we're nowhere and everywhere, which sort of confused people, but the intent was we're nowhere in the sense of not being part of any division or school. It's a unit that reports directly to the chancellor, who will have an, an oversight committee of the chancellor, the executive vice chancellor, and a couple of people from the chancellor's cabinet. So Rajesh and I as co-directors will report to them, and our, we'll have a faculty council. It would serve kind of like an academic department, but rotating and, fl and fluid and drawn from people who are, who are already here to provide some guidance. And it will rotate over time. Uh, we don't see that as, as necessarily being a fixed thing. And, and so we're nowhere in the sense of we're not in any one place, but we're everywhere. We'll have physical presence in the San Diego Supercomputer Center. That not only is because it's the Supercomputer Center, but it gets us on the north side of campus, which is where Rady School of Management, Global Policy Studies, Social Sciences is. We'll have space in Atkinson Hall, which is another nexus, and we'll have space in uh, Scripps and the School of Medicine. And a lot of the activities that we'll have will involve rotating talks and things around these different places. I remember the first time I went to Scripps, I didn't know, it was a big obstacle. Where do you park? Right. Little things like that will impede uh, fluid uh, dis discussions. So getting people over that hump is going to be important. So that's been, um, that's been the strategy that we've used um, so far. And um, the, the new things really are this organizational format. We hope to have faculty positions that we will not be hiring. We will be working with these clusters to identify interdisciplinary hires. Uh, but we're not doing RFPs. We're not saying we have a position, you know, we're, we, they have to come to us and say this is a need we have and, and justify it. And, and we've gotten a very strong message, message from, from not only the chancellor's office, but, but the executive vice chancellor's office that a lot of our methods, those of you who some of you have dealt with this, I know. The allocation of resources is, is very um, much organized along rigid lines. And so if you've got a class where you have TAs that come from computer science and cognitive science, for example, well, they get paid differently and who, which department is going to get the credit and stuff. And so what we've been told is we now recognize the design lab played a very important role in making this, this problem clear. And I think we've come along fortunately to be able to, they're, they're not at the point there where they're saying, we need to fix this. And you can come up with some ideas and, and we'll, 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 we'll try them. So um, I, this is getting close to, to the, the two things that I, I just want to close with. You know, this isn't pie in the sky. It's not, I, you know, I tend to be a Pollyanna. And I, and I know that. There's a lot of stuff that's, that's it's hard. And we're getting some resistance. We tend to get resistance um, less from the faculty 
who are directly involved and more from people just kind of in principle. Worries about, well, is this going to work? It's new, it's different, the fears of, of, of turf. We're very much focused on problems and having that be a driver, which isn't to say that it's not really important to have strong technical scientific foundations, but very often problems are what drive the innovation of new, new technology. Um, you know, there is some tendency people say, oh, here's an opportunity, a land grab. You've got some FTEs, you have money, you've got money for, you know, hiring uh, technical staff, give me some. We're getting a lot of that. And we have to gently and politely say, well, actually, no. Uh, the buy-in has been less of a problem. I think the culture, the habit, getting out of our silos is going to be a subtle one that colors a lot of what we do. So, so there is definitely hard stuff. We don't know if it's going to succeed. We're very committed to constantly reevaluating. There, there are encouraging things. I've talked about um, a lot of this already, I think. I think the recognition that everybody is frustrated with the way we do business. Um, people are in particular excited about data science. There is a hunger for connecting across campus. We hear, surprisingly, people at Scripps say, I really want to talk to those anthropologists. And they, they have good reason for wanting to talk to them. And, and, and vice versa. And there is, there is an eagerness and a desire to explore new possibilities, even when there's, there's, there's fear. And I think one of the things the strategic planning process did license or legitimize was really admitting, you know, we're here, we care about our students. There were days when you didn't say that, actually. Uh, we care about diversity. We care about social impact. We care about making this a, a, a better world. That sort of language, you know, even five, ten years ago, that is not what you heard much of. So that has been liberating and, and encouraging. So I'm guardedly hopeful um, that this will not only help with data science, but also be one of the models that we can use to explore how to, um, how to be innovative and maintain creativity, interdisciplinarity, uh, innovation, and heighten our impact in the world and make the world a better place. So I think I'm out of time. Let me thank you and conclude.